this this is an article titled a soviet colonel makes the biggest gamble in history by insider you guys can go check it out the full article if you want it, it details nine almost nuclear accidental strikes and, and this is just one of them so it goes just after midnight on september 26 1983 Soviet satellite operators at the Serpikov 15 bunker just south of Moscow got a warning that a U.S. Minuteman nuclear missile had been launched. Later, four more missiles were detected. Tensions between the U.S. and Soviet Union were strained earlier in the month when the Soviets shot down Korean Airlines Flight 007 near Sakhalin Island, killing all 269 people on board, including U.S. Congressman Larry McDonald. The commanding officer at the bunker, Stanislav Petrov, was to inform his superiors of the launches so an appropriate response could be made. Soviet policy back then called for an all-out retaliatory strike. Knowing this, Petrov decided not to inform his superiors. He said, all I had to do was reach for the phone, raise the direct line to our top commanders, but I couldn't move. I felt like I was sitting on a hot frying pan. He recalled... Uh, he felt like I was sitting on a hot frying pan, he recalled. He reasoned that if the U.S. were to strike the Soviet Union with nuclear weapons, they would send hundreds of missiles, not just five. But Petrov had no way of knowing if he was right until enough time had passed, by which time the nuclear bombs could have hit their target, arguably making his decision the biggest gamble in human history. After 23 minutes, Petrov's theory that it was a false alarm was confirmed, and it was later discovered that a Soviet satellite had mistaken sunlight reflecting off the top of clouds as missiles. So it's, a, it's actually, you know, it's, it's hilariously dark and scary that the world could end because, you know, someone my age, like a 28 year old, just sitting at a command center is on a team of other people to decide what are we going to do? And, two guys sitting next to me say yeah and then they're just waiting for me to give the okay and i'm just like like this is like an uh moment where you're you're just like ah uh, like is it a nuclear missile is it something else like i don't know fuck it like and then could have easily just said yeah let's do it so uh, is is there something to be said about how easy it is to have an accident like this that will literally kill could kill the entire planet could destroy the earth eventually um and even if it doesn't get to that point kill millions hundreds of millions of people is there is there something to be said about how easy this process is like like hilariously easy this this sounds like a sketch that you would see on snl or something and what can be done to make it a little bit harder to nuke a city well, yes, of great concern that um, accidents like this can happen. And as I mentioned before, the, um, un the Soviets had just put into place a new detection system. So this is a scary thing, is that you don't want the military to start putting in new detection systems to try to prevent these kinds of first strikes. And we face the possibility now they'll do this with artificial intelligence because of the shortening response times. Mm. So the first way to solve this problem is to remove the ability of the United States president to launch a nuclear strike all by himself. It, we shouldn't allow one person to do that. And of course, really, there are uh, probably lower level commanders that have the ability to do this, um, although they're supposed to be controlled in various ways. But having one person be able to do that is, you know, very dangerous. Uh, the second thing we could do is to get rid of the land-based missiles on the United States. They're, they're nothing but a waste of money. Um, you know, there's been scandal after scandal from the people sitting there because it's boring. You know, and so they, they do things like, oh, it takes two people to push the buttons. Oh, I'm going to go get a pizza. Here, here's a long stick. You can push my button and your button. Well, I'm gone getting my pizza. That kind of thing yeah. happened. It doesn't, can't happen now. They've found ways to control mm. it electronically. You know, presumably mm. some hacker could hack into the system if they you know, were really motivated. It might be not that easy. Um, yeah. but nevertheless, there's no reason to have those land-based missiles there. It's just a target in the center of the country. There's 400 of them sitting up here in 
Wyoming and Colorado and uh, Montana. Uh, you know, they're purposeless. Uh, and uh, the only reason that they're probably there is to support the economies of those states, which is not a good reason to have nuclear targets in the United States. We should just move them off to submarines yeah. or airplanes that can be recalled. Then you don't have to protect them mm. with a short learning time, warning time. Mm. Um, and, that, you know, this is not the scariest uh, re- re- example. The scariest example um, is described in great detail in a recent book by Daniel Ellsberg about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, so mm. what happened in the Cuban Missile Crisis is, uh, to paraphrase his book, and he was in the Kennedy administration, so he knew in detail what happened. He's also famous for bringing down Richard Nixon in the Pentagon Papers. Um, at any rate, mm. what happened there was Russia was trying to move missiles into Cuba so they could reach the United States with little warning. And we didn't want that to happen. And um, so we set up a blockade around Cuba to prevent it from happening. And uh, there were a number of Russian submarines there at the time. I think there were six of them. And we decided, oh, it'd be fun to drive them to the surface. And um, so people started throwing hand grenades into the water, uh, which to the Russians sounded like depth charges. Yeah. And I think five out of six of them did surface and they all got fired for surfacing. Um, but the scary part is that one of the submarines decided to launch its nuclear missile, its, nu- its nuclear torpedoes, some of the American ships. And um, mm. so there was a captain of the ship decided to launch them. But fortunately, there was an information officer on board who was a political figure and prevented that from happening. Otherwise, it would have been a nuclear war right there. Um, and then the, furthermore, what happened is we, you know, the Cubans were partly in control of things like um, anti-aircraft. I shot down an American spy plane. And um, unfortunately, uh, it wasn't just these long-range missiles that were there. Um, there were also tactical nuclear weapons there. And so had the United States decided to actually invade Cuba, uh, which they had done, uh, had tried a few mm. years earlier in the Bay of Pigs, uh, they would have been attacked by about 50 nuclear weapons in Cuba. Now, that would have certainly triggered a nuclear war. You know, so there are multiple examples there that are highly parallel to the situation we're in now with Ukraine. You know, this is why the administration is being so careful not to get sucked into further into this Ukrainian thing. You know, if you start putting NATO aircraft in there, uh, you know, they can be mistaken for nuclear weapons carrying aircraft. Uh, if you start you know, shooting down Russian airplanes, that can expand the war. You know, it's, it's terrifying to go and read what happened in the 19, early 1960s in this Cuban Missile Crisis and to think about how easily that could have led to a global nuclear war. And, uh, you know, the parallels that, with that and the current situation are pretty strong. So you mentioned getting rid of the, the land missiles. I wanted to ask you, let, let's do unrealistic changes first. So if you could wave a wand and change global nuclear policy, arsenal size, agreements, anything you wanted, however you wanted, what changes would you make? Could be unrealistic as right. possible. So to be unrealistic and idealistic, you know, I would... Idealistic, yeah. yeah I would probably take uh, you know, Carl Sagan and said, you know, it's just elementary planetary hygiene to get rid of all the nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons have no purpose. There is nothing that they do that's useful. I'm sitting here in Colorado. They blew up three nuclear weapons in Colorado to um, see if they could um, produce oil from oil shale. And um, sure, they did produce some oil there, gas, Mm -hmm. but it was radioactive. You know, for a while, mm-hmm. they were going to use nuclear weapons to make mountain passes and things like that. You know, those things are just unnecessary. Uh, so there's no real reason we need nuclear weapons. In an ideal world, we just get rid of them. So what, if you're, if you're someone like the president or you're someone who is pro-nuclear weapons and a shit ton of them what is the thing that someone like that thinks is useful like if they had if you ask them to write down you know what are your top three reasons for wanting these nuclear weapons 
what are the reasons that most often come up? Well, there's really only one reason, and which is mutual assured destruction. And so the idea of mutual assured destruction is that um, you will be afraid to attack me because if you do, I will destroy you in return. Mm. And um, Alan Roebuck and I wrote a book or a paper, and you know Carl had already presented this kind of an idea, which is we called SAD for self-assured destruction, which is that if you mm. use your missiles on another country, then the smoke will come back and destroy your agricultural system and you'll starve to death. And Russia is especially mm. susceptible to that. Um, so, you know, I think the most likely thing to happen is that we will continue the build down of nuclear weapons. This was okay until the Trump administration mm. went in and started canceling treaties. You know, so they they uh, canceled the treaty that Gorbachev and Reagan had uh, put together. And um, that's led to the uh, Russians building all kinds of new weapons, or maybe they had already started building them. There's some question about whether the Russians were already violating the treaty. And, yeah. Um, so you know, it wasn't like they had no reason to do it, but all they did was make a huge mess by causing that treaty to go away. And they canceled the Open Skies Treaty, which allowed um, us to fly over Russia and photograph their facilities and for them to play over the United States and photograph our facilities. I think the Russians became obnoxious and flew over the Capitol or something and took a picture. Trump canceled it, but that was really stupid yeah. because now we can't really look at the Russian facilities in great detail. Uh, and then the Trump administration also tried to cancel the um, Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, which um, controls a number of weapons. And, you know, uh, Biden came in just before it expired and was able to continue it. So the most hopeful thing we could do out of this situation in Iran is to come up with some new treaties to drive the number of weapons down. So the practical thing to have happen, I think, is that... Um, that so this is more realistic. More, yeah, the more you, you realistic actually... thing to have happen uh, is to continue to reduce the nuclear arsenals. And as I mentioned, I, at first I get rid of those land-based missiles so we don't have this problem in the short warning time. And, um, you know, right now there's only 200 cities in Russia with more than 100,000 people. We don't need more than a few hundred nuclear weapons to destroy Russia. Hey guys, this is a quick reminder to check out Auxoro Premium, the best deal in premium podcasting. On Auxoro Premium, you gain access to bonus episodes, the unlicensed therapy series, the ability to submit topic suggestions for the podcast, exclusive Ask Me Anything episodes, and the entire premium catalog for only five bucks per month. Go to auxoro.supercast.com, that's A-U-X-O-R-O.supercast.com to join the premium gang today. 